Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go, and in today's video we'll be exploring solid waste. In natural systems, there's no such thing as waste. Everything flows in a natural cycle of use and reuse. Living organisms will consume materials and eventually return them to the environment, usually in a different form, for reuse. Now, most of today's advanced industrialized countries have a high throughput or high waste economy that attempts to sustain their economic growth by an ever increasing flow of matter. Now, much of that matter is going to end up being waste, and some of that waste can actually be classified as solid waste. Solid waste would be any unwanted or discarded material that we produce that's not a liquid or a gas. Solid waste typically can be classified as either being industrial solid waste or municipal solid waste. Industrial solid waste would be the waste that's produced by industries as they produce our goods and services that we're going to consume. Typically, we don't see this waste. Um, we're only receiving the product. It is when it arrives at our home that we're going to produce some municipal solid waste. That's the waste that we're going to actually see as it goes into our garbage and is picked up every week. Now, overall, the United States produces about a third of the world's solid waste. And because we've got a rather large country, we feel that there's some places where we can tuck that waste underground in landfills. About 98.5% of that waste actually is generated by industry. Only about 1.5% actually is produced at our homes. We're, we're throwing away approximately four and a half pounds of trash each day. Now, unfortunately, some of that trash actually doesn't make its way to the landfill or to the incinerator. Some of that waste may actually end up in the ocean, where it could become part of the Great uh, Pacific Garbage Patch. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a gyre of marine debris that's full of high concentrations of floating plastics, chemical sludge, and other debris that's been trapped in the slow-moving currents of the North Pacific Gyre. Some estimates have the size of the gyre being twice the size of Texas. Now, this huge garbage patch presents a number of hazards for marine life, fishing, and tourism. It can enter into the food chain as filter feeders and small fish ingest it, and then move up the food chain as larger fish and marine birds actually consume uh, the smaller fish and filter feeders. This plastic can either poison the organisms or actually lead to deadly blockages. The garbage itself will wash up on beaches, further disrupting ecosystem and just making for a very unpleasant unple place to visit. Another uh, large area of concern in terms of solid waste is our electronic waste. Electronic waste can consist of a lot of toxic and hazardous substances like PVC, lead, mercury, and cadmium. The United States produces almost half of the world's electronic waste, between 20 to 50 metric tons per year, but it only recycles about 10%. And when that electronic waste is recycled, much of it ends up on the shores of China, India, and Africa because it's far cheaper to break it down there than in developed countries where there are strict environmental and worker safety laws. So when we're replacing our electronics and hopefully recycling them, we have to consider, is it fair that it's going to be potentially recycled in a developing country? Would you actually pay more to recycle responsibly? Now, most analysts call for using an integrated waste management approach, which is going to use a variety of strategies so that we can reduce and manage our waste. Prioritizing first the reduction of waste production, with a second priority falling on reusing and recycling. And finally, if we're unable to recycle or reuse, we should responsibly dispose of those products. The priorities of integrated waste management can be summarized by the five R's. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and then responsibly dispose. Our first priorities of integrated waste management include refusing and reducing. We shouldn't buy items that have too much packaging, like a banana that's surrounded by plastic and paper. Um, we should consume less and only buy what we need. And if we do that, we're going to reduce a lot of the waste that we produce. 
If we reuse and refill containers, we're going to use a lot less resources and produce a lot less waste. In fact, every five minutes, two million plastic bottles are used in the United States. Imagine how many fewer plastic bottles will be utilized if we switch to refillable containers. Refilling also uses a whole lot less energy and saves money. An aluminum can used once requires an input of about 30,000 kilocalories of energy, whereas that energy input is reduced to about 3,000 kilocalories if we refill a drink bottle 10 times. You might think the movement to uh, a refillable society uh, might be difficult, but in Denmark and in Canada's Prince Edward Island, there's actually a ban on all beverage containers that can't be reused. In Finland, 95% of all soft drink and alcoholic beverages are refillable. In Germany, it's 75%. Our next priority in integrated waste management would be recycling. Recycling paper, glass, and plastics, and buying items that are made out of recycled materials. Recycling has a number of environmental and economic benefits from reducing pollution and deforestation, as well as using less energy. Remember that a uh, virgin aluminum can requires an input of 30,000 kilocalories of energy. But by recycling that same aluminum can, we're down to 10,000 uh, kilocalories of energy needed. Now, there are two types of recycling. There's primary or closed loop recycling, in which materials of one type are turned into products of the same, so going from an aluminum can to an aluminum can. Whereas secondary recycling, we take our materials and convert them into different products uh, using uh, old tires to shred them up into uh, rubberized road surfaces, uh, shredding jeans to create insulation, or even turning plastic bottles into ink pens. Now many communities have turned to single stream recycling due to its ease. Waste is sent to a materials recovery facility and then separated. There are two general types of material covers facility. There's dirty MRFs, which receive commingled trash and recyclables. And then there are clean MRFs that receive only recyclables. Materials recovery facilities can recover between 5 to 45 percent of the recyclable materials. Now there is some question as to whether or not moving to single stream is beneficial to both the economy and the environment. Dual stream and single stream recycling each have their own pros and cons. Dual stream recycling is a little more expensive to operate because it requires a pickup of first of trash and then a later pickup of recycling. Dual stream recycling requires sorting at home. Uh, this is a little more inconvenient to each family, but um, because it is humans sorting the trash and the recycling, it's going to require less energy overall. Unfortunately, dual stream recycling is typically only available in urban areas due to the expense of the dual pickup. It also relies on individual families to recycle, so not everyone is going to be recycling. Single stream recycling is a little bit cheaper to operate because you're only picking up trash and recycling once, but it is much more expensive to start. It is also more energy intensive because we oftentimes need to involve machines to be able to separate the trash and the recycling. But fortunately, 45% of all the trash that's picked up is actually being recycled. To promote separation of waste where single stream is unavailable, 4,000 communities in the United States have implemented a pay-as-you-throw-away or a fee-per-bag waste collection systems. So if you're paying more to throw your trash away, then you're going to remove those recyclables so you'll actually pay less. The movement to a matter recycling economy from a high throughput economy is much more sustainable since it does a much better job at mimicking nature and a whole lot less high quality matter will be degraded. But unfortunately, matter recycling economies are only going to be a stopgap solution. Recycling is still going to require an input of energy. Not everything can be recycled easily. Uh, for example, many recycling facilities only accept number one and number two polyethylene pl plastics and not number five polypropylene. There's a limit to the number of times that something can actually be recycled because with each recycling event, the matter is further degraded. And then finally, recycling can actually produce a lot of hazardous byproducts. So our final priority of integrated waste management will be that responsible disposal. 
If we can't reuse or recycle that matter, it must be disposed of responsibly so it does not become a hazard to the environment. The two major methods of disposal would either be burning or burying. Solid waste can be burned in waste to energy incinerators, which boil water to make steam for heating or the, for, for the production of electricity. What we have left over is different types of ash. Uh, bottom ash can actually be disposed of in a conventional landfill, but toxic materials that will be found in fly ash will be then sent to a hazardous waste landfill. Japan and a few European countries incinerate most of their waste because they don't have the landfill space to accommodate all the waste that's being produced. There are countries like Sweden that are actually running low on actual solid waste to burn uh, to heat homes and produce electricity, and so they're actually importing trash from other countries um, so that they can maintain their waste to energy incinerators. Now, most of the world's municipal solid waste is actually going to be buried in landfills. Unfortunately, many of those landfills are expected to leak toxic liquids into the soil and the underlying groundwater. Now, there are two types of landfills. There are open dumps and sanitary landfills. Open dumps are basically just big fields or holes in the ground where garbage is deposited and sometimes covered with soil, and mostly this is used in developed country, developing countries. Sanitary landfills, on the other hand, that where the solid waste is going to be spread out in thin layers, compacted and covered daily with a fresh layer of clay or plastic foam. State-of-the-art sanitary landfills are designed to eliminate or minimize environmental problems that might plague older landfills. These state-of-the-art systems have leachate collection systems that are able to collect uh, liquids that are leaching from our waste and pump them to the surface so they can be actually treated and perhaps not impact uh, the groundwater. There is systems to actually recover the methane that is being released through the anaerobic and aerobic de decomposition of the organic material in that particular landfill. Um, the methane can actually be collected and then used as fuel to generate electricity. Since 1997, only mon modern sanitary landfills are allowed in the United States. As a result, many older and small landfills have been closed and replaced with larger local and regional modern landfills. When landfills are closed or reach their end of life, they are going to be capped with a plastic cover, clay, and then filled in. Previous landfills can serve as parks and recreation areas. A perfect example of this would be Mount Trashmore in Virginia Beach. When it closed, in order to cover it, uh, land had to be excavated. That created two ponds, one of which is used for recreation. The landfill itself has running parks and playgrounds and is widely used by the citizens of Virginia Beach. The most sustainable method for dealing with waste is to convert to a low throughput economy, shifting to an economy that does not rely on an input of lots of energy and lots of matter. That way we're controlling our pollution and limiting how much matter that we produce. Now this is going to require a major shift in how we consume resources. Many folks all over the globe have attempted a zero garbage challenge, trying to minimize the amount of waste that they produce and heralding in that low input economy. Uh, a citizen of Charlottesville uh, by the name of Rose Brown actually started a zero garbage challenge and she's attempted to minimize the amount of waste that she utilizes in her life. Uh, this bag here represents the amount of waste that she has produced for one year. Um, compare that to the amount of solid material that you put into the trash each day. While we all may not be able to be as successful as Rose in reducing the amount of waste that we produce, we can certainly endeavor to follow the priorities of integrated waste management to reduce the amount of waste that we produce so that we can live more sustainably with the environment.